Good morning, future PTAs. I hope that you guys are doing well. Um, this is try number two on recording this lecture because I lost the first one and that was so disappointing that my heart is broken over all that work I put into it and it didn't save. So let's start talking about wheelchair mobility, proper fit, and assistive devices. So a wheelchair is a stable surface on a mobile base. It allows you to move and yet gives you postural support. Um, in order to propel a wheelchair, you need all of the following. Cognitive ability, your ability to think and process information, strength, range of motion, motor control, and cardiopulmonary endurance. If you don't have all of those things, then you will need someone to push you in the wheelchair or an electric wheelchair. Um, these are the, what we're going to cover in this lecture, selecting the proper wheelchair, fitting a wheelchair, how to propel the wheelchair, managing falls, and maintenance on the chair itself. So the things that you consider when you're choosing the right wheelchair for someone is the patient's goals and desires, their anticipated use, their abilities and limitations, their size and weight, their caregiver needs, financial, community, social resources, and then projected changes over time. I put this picture here because it just shows three different um, types of wheelchairs, and these are just sports wheelchairs. So that's just a variety of wheelchairs in uh, high-end sports for para um, athletes and things like that. And of course, there's a huge variety for those that aren't being used for sports. Some of the parts of the wheelchair, there is the backrest, the um, seat, the armrest and the front rigging, all of those give you postural support. The mobility comes in with the frame, the axle, the drive wheels. The drive wheels are the big wheels. The casters are the small wheels in front. Uh, of course, we have locks to put the brakes on. And uh, the leg rest and the armrest can typically be removed and replaced um, as needed. The front rigging here are also called the leg rest. Just another picture of all the parts and a calf pad can be put on there for someone with significant weakness to keep their leg from falling off the back. Um, so electrically powered wheelchairs, there's different types. There's four wheel, three wheel, scooters. Um, the, the drive itself can be from front wheel, mid wheel, or rear, rear wheel drive, kind of like your options with a car. And then the controls, there's typically a joystick that you use to move the chair forward, backwards, in different directions. There may be a drive stick, a hand grip, there may even be, there's one called a sip and puff wheelchair for somebody who doesn't have use of their arms. Um, the, there's a straw that goes in their mouth and they can blow or suck on the straw to make it go in different directions or to go and stop. Um, so really there's a amazing uh, capability with the different controls that there are. Um, some of them actually you can also use your head movements, push to a button one side, push there, back and forward to also control for someone who is a quadriplegic. So here are the trade-offs. If you're going for more stability in a wheelchair, then you'll have less mobility and vice versa. Um, you can go for specificity or versatility, cost or complexity, size or maneuverability, support or size and weight, like the, the more lightweight, shock absorption versus energy expenditure, and then support versus portability. So depending on what the wheelchair will be used for, what the patient's specific needs are, you determine kind of what end of the spectrum on each of these that they need. If they need just a basic something to get them from point A to point B, it would be a completely different chair than someone who's planning to participate in uh, track events um, in the Paralympics or something like that, completely different types of chairs. Here's an example of a lightweight chair. Um, it's really easy to stow away and pick up and move and go around very quickly in versus a, a bariatric chair that holds more weight. 
Um, this one has head support if they don't have head control. And it looks like it is on, um, it is power, a power wheelchair as well. Your standard wheelchair versus your sports wheelchair, the frame is different, the angle of the wheels is different, they have a lot less back support, big difference. Different power wheelchairs, there's a power electric wheelchair right here, and then the scooter right here. They have different features and versatilities. Pediatric wheelchair for children. Here's an integrated standard where they can stay in the wheelchair and actually move to a standing position. A reclining wheelchair with that, just the back portion reclines. A tilt and space wheelchair, the entire chair can recline. And then customized wheelchair. On this picture, they have um, an armrest, maybe for someone with hemiplegia or significant weakness in that arm so that the arm doesn't fall off. Um, and they also have a uh, leg rest here for someone with an amputation. Um, this type of leg rest could also be used for somebody who had weakness or um, needed extra support at the leg so that it didn't fall to the side or to the back. Proper fit of the wheelchair. So we're going to measure the patient's body and convert it to wheelchair dimensions. Um, we typically have them in their usual clothing, footwear, and with whatever cushion they're going to use so we can get accurate dimensions. And we measure them in a good position. They need to be sit sitting upright and um, not slouched. We do not contour the tape measure, so you don't bend it to fit the patient's needs. You keep it straight like a ruler and uh, position the pelvis well um, to, and the rest of the body will follow. But I want to show you what it means to position the pelvis well. Right here is an example of sacral sitting, so it's kind of a slouched posture. And the problem with it is if you uh, measure seat depth and other things as well, um, the back height and things, but especially seat depth with them in a slouch position, it's going to be too long because you're actually measuring an empty space plus their actual leg measurement. Um, so you want to scoot them all the way back in their um, chair, wherever. Here I go again. Man, I made it through the whole video yesterday without yawning but it didn't say, and here I go yawning. Um, but have them sitting upright so you can get the proper measurement. The way that you uh, measure the depth of the seat is you measure from the back of the hips um, to the popliteal fold, so the back of the knee, and then you subtract two inches to make sure there's enough room between the back of the knee and the seat so that it doesn't place pressure on the back of the knee. Um, you certainly don't want you certainly don't want um, them to have pressure on the back of the knee because it could cut off their blood flow, their circulation, and make that area numb or create a pressure sore. Um, you can also then put them in supine, have them lay on their back, and take that measurement again to make sure that you've got the accurate measurement. And if it's more than an inch or two off, more than an inch really off, then you know that they were probably sacral sitting. And so your initial measurement was a little bit too long. Um, you could just have them in that position initially or the whole time. And that could also help with avoiding um, measuring it too long. Seat width, the patient's sitting and you measure the outer edges of the hips from one hip to the other and then you add one to two inches. There's some wiggle room here because if you make the chair too wide, then you're less likely to fit through doorways. Um, if you make it too narrow, then it will put pressure on the patient's hips or the side of their hips and could create a sore. So you want it wide enough that it's not touching them on both sides, but narrow enough that it will still fit through the spaces that you need it to fit for, fit through. Um, this slide just kind of shows you what each um, 
area is called uh, for a reference, but also, and then we'll go into seat to floor height. So this red one right here is the seat to floor height. Uh, the purple one across is the seat width we just discussed. The blue one up is the back height. The seat depth is orange here. We talked about that a couple slides ago. The armrest height is green, and then the footrest length is red. So if you're wondering what one of the measurements is referring to, you can look back on this and see exactly what it means. Um, so the seat to floor height, this red one right here, you measure from the sole of the shoe to the popliteal fossa, so the back of the knee, and then you subtract the thickness of the compressed cushion. So anytime you're using a cushion, you want them... Oops, with them sitting on it, and you're always going to subtract um, the, the height of that cushion um, once they're sitting. If you subtract the full height and it's not compressed, then it, you will get a measurement that's not quite long enough. Um, it, if you don't add it in at all, it's not going to be good either. So once you get that measurement, you add two more inches to make sure there's good foot clearance underneath the footrest um, for the seat to floor height. So seat to floor height, you measure from the sole of the foot to the back of the knee, the popliteal fossa. Take away the measure, the thickness of the compressed cushion and add two inches for foot clearance. If they are planning to use their foot to push the chair around, then you won't subtract those two inches. So if maybe they're a hemiplegic and they're planning to use the left arm and the left hand, uh, foot to move the chair, then you don't subtract the two inches because you want your, their foot flat on the floor. All right, back height, you measure from the seated surface um, up to either the inferior angle of the scapula or to the oxilla, and then you subtract four inches. Now, if they have really poor back support, they may need something a little bit higher than that, but this would be for a standard fit. And uh, make sure you also add in the compressed cushion thickness. So you want to um, have enough height that the cushion doesn't make them go up too high. So you add there the compressed cushion versus subtracting it before. With the armrest, you have the patient sit with their arms to their side and at a 90 degree angle and to measure the distance between the elbow and the sitting surface. So the elbow there and the surface they're sitting on. Um, you may add one inch to give a little extra support so it kind of de-weights the arm. Um, and if there is a, com a cushion being used, then you want to also add in the thickness of the compressed cushion. So that would be the armrest height. So a quick review of all the different things that we said and so you can get straight where you add in and where you take away. With the seat to floor height, number one right here, you measure from the sole of the foot to the popliteal fossa. You add two inches to uh, ensure foot clearance that the footrest is not dragging the floor, but you subtract the compressed cushion thickness. With the seat depth, number two right here, you measure from the back of the hips to the popliteal fossa and you subtract two inches so that the front of the chair is not pushing into the back of the knee. With the seat width, you measure from the outer surface of each hip and then you add one or two inches to make sure that there's enough room on each side for their hips not to be touching the side of the wheelchair without making the wheelchair too wide to fit through their doors. With the back height, you measure from the sitting surface to the inferior angle of the scapula or to the armpits and you subtract four inches, but make sure you add back in the thickness of the compressed cushion. And then with the uh, armrest height, you measure from the sitting surface to the um, elbow, the electronon process, you add one inch to help support the arm and add in the thickness of the compressed cushion. So with the compressed cushion, you're subtracting it for seat to floor height and adding it for back and armrest height. So it only affects the height, not the width or the depth, but the height.
These are types of cushions. There's a huge variety based on what the patient needs and uh, how long they'll be sitting in the chair. And a proper cushion is going to keep them from getting skin breakdown, so it's um, a big deal to get the right cushion for the right person. Negative effects of an ill-fitting chair. So if it's too wide, then it won't fit through doorways. If it's too narrow, it will put pressure on the sides of the hip and create a sore or at least some skin breakdown. If it's too shallow, it won't allow enough support underneath the legs. They might slide off the front. If it's too deep, it will push into the back of the knee and uh, cause pressure there. If you don't have enough cushion, then you're gonna have skin breakdown on the bottom. If the seat is too low, your feet will drag. If it's too high, you won't be able to use your feet to propel or it will also be harder to get into for the patient to get transferred into or out of, just depending on how you're doing it. Um, if the back is too low, it will not add enough support. If it's too high, then it will restrict their movement to grab the wheel or to turn um, as they need to. So below on this slide, there's also some other um, options of what, how each of these could affect a patient. Um, with an ill-fitting wheelchair, you're welcome to look at those or to kind of brainstorm yourself how you think it would affect the patient. Now we'll move to wheelchair propulsion. So when you are pushing, this is a dependent level surface. So someone is pushing someone in a wheelchair on a flat surface. Uh, when you're pushing somebody, it's really important to have good body mechanics so you don't hurt yourself to go at a smooth pace and to protect their dignity. Ask them, do you want to go in here? Or are you good here? Where would you like for me to uh, move you? Or, you know, even explaining things to them. If they're not able to verbalize, you could say, "We're right now we're going through the doorway, we're on our way to the car. You know, let them know what they're doing so they're an active part of the process. And then whenever you get it where you want it to go, make sure you put the locks on. You're not safe until you have the locks on. If you are on an uneven surface like carpet, grass, gravel, um, or going up and down curb or sand, it's a lot harder to push. So then the biomechanics become even more important. You want to make sure you're pushing with the legs and um, put your back into it. <laughs> um, it may be necessary to tip the wheelchair backwards when they're in this wheelie position. Um, it's a little bit easier to move. We will go over how to go up and down a curb, but certainly doing a wheelie there is necessary and it may be necessary for a hard surface that you're moving on. Um, for independent mobility with wheelchair, we imagine that there is a clock on the wheels and that 12 o'clock is up top, 6 o'clock is at the bottom, and as you move forward, you're getting to smaller numbers, 1, 2, 3. As you move backwards, you're getting to larger numbers, 11, 10, 9. So you start with your hand at the 10 o'clock position, and then you pull the wheel forward and let go when you're at about the 2 or 3 o'clock position. So in order to propel the wheelchair yourself, you start by grabbing the wheel in the back around 10 o'clock position, move it forward and let it go at the 2 or 3 o'clock position. Um, that's how we'll teach. And if you were trying to really picture a clock on the wheel, then it would be better to picture it on the other side of the wheel because then it would be more accurate um, to go from 10 to 2. So if you need help picturing that, just let me know and I'll see. I tried to look for a picture and it just, there wasn't one. Um, if you are able, you could use your feet to propel as well. So especially with patients with hemiplegia, they're only able to use one arm, so they also use one leg to propel. And uh, so they combine their hand and that leg. Um, it may be the opposite hand and leg, depending on you know a certain injury after a car wreck. They might have broken one arm and broken the other leg or whatever. But whatever they have available, you want to use what they have to teach them to independently propel the wheelchair. This is an example of a wheelie where you're balancing on the back uh, wheels. It's pretty necessary for independent propulsion. There are certain situations where you have to get up into a wheelie before you're able to get on a curb or to um, move over an object in your pathway. So you should practice that with a patient who's going to be independent, but you want to practice it in a controlled environment so that if they fall, they're not getting hurt.
Um, some things that you want to make sure somebody is competent with before they start using power mobility um, is that they're able to control your, their speed, to brake effectively, to maneuver through doorways, bedrooms, whatnot, and to safely slow themselves for parking at tables or other places like that. If you are pushing someone through a doorway and the door opens away from the patient, so it's opening out into the outside here, they are walking backwards. So walking backwards through. So you turn the person around, you kind of use your backside to open the door and your foot to hold it open while you pull them through. And once you're all the way through the door, you turn them around, going backwards through the opening. Another way that you can do it if the door opens towards you, so now same side or same door, other side, um, is you move through forward, you open the door, you hold it open with your foot, and then you push the patient through. If the patient is independent and they're going that, through a door that opens away from them, they get as close to the door as they can, they push the door open as wide as they can and try and um, go through quickly. If they're quick enough, then their wheel should stop the um, door from, or even their front rigging should stop the door from closing on them. That way they can use both hands to wheel the chair. If they're going through a door that opens um, towards them, they get as close to the door as they can. Typically they'll angle to the side, open the door as wide as they can, start going through the wheelchair, and again, the base of the wheelchair can stop the door from closing in on them. Now when we're talking about wheelchair mobility, we know that we need ramps instead of stairs, ideally. Um, and so the main two things I want you to know about making a proper ramp for someone is that the slope needs to, it cannot rise more than, we'll say one inch for every 12 inches of length. Okay, so another way of saying that is however tall the surface is that you're trying to build a ramp to, you need 12 inches of length for every one inch of height. So since 12 inches is a foot, you need a foot of length for every one inch of height. So if the uh, stairs are two feet, uh, 24 inches, then you would need 20, a 24 foot long ramp in order to not have too um, intense of a slope. For the proper amount of slope, you would need a 24 foot ramp for a 24 inch high surface. Okay, and if you had an 18 inch um, area that you needed to push someone up in order to make a proper ramp, you would need 18 feet of length in order for the ramp to be have the appropriate amount of incline. Um, you do not want to have a ramp that rises over 30 inches. That's kind of the highest that you would like to make the ramp. Um, that's an ideal situation. I certainly have seen ramps that do go higher, but most of them kind of rather than going straight out, they'll kind of wrap around if you've ever seen those, um, kind of like a line at an amusement park, they wrap around so that uh, they don't have to take up so much space but can still have the proper amount of incline. When you are pushing someone up a stairs, uh, up a ramp, <laughs> um, if you're going forward, you can either push them with all four wheels on the ground. If so, have them lean forward to take some of the weight off the back of the wheelchair and that can help you move it more easily, or you can place them in a wheelie position and then um, push them up. If the slope is too steep, you may have to zigzag back and forth um, and make sure you have good body mechanics, that you're using your legs to push, that your back is straight and you're not leaning forward and muscling it out with your hands. Another option is going up a ramp backwards. So you could turn the patient around and pull them up a ramp. You could do it in a wheelie formation. You could also do it with the legs on the ground. Ideally, you would do it in the wheelie position though. 
um, but you definitely need good body mechanics. We use the foot to push the bottom of the wheelchair to start out with the wheelie position. And then oftentimes we'll put our leg there to kind of um, control the back portion. Um, if nothing else, you need a wide base of support and your stomach muscles should be really held tight <laughs> throughout the process. When we're going down an incline, um, typically it's easiest to go backwards down the incline. You want to um, make sure you go on a straight path so that you don't start to swerve and almost fall off the side of the ramp. So glance back periodically, um, but also you want to maintain your trunk erect and the tr patient's trunk is also erect. Um, if they're able to help by slowing down how fast they're going down the ramp, they can grab a hold of the um, push rims around the wheel and slow down the speed of them. I would only recommend this if they had gloves on, otherwise it could really tear their hands up. So um, if so, if they have gloves on, they can slow it down that way. Um, another way is to tip the wheelchair back into a wheelie and then go forward down the, de the decline. Here it's shown on the stairs just because I couldn't find a good picture of what, I, uh, what this looks like, but you're pulling them back into a wheelie and then going down the incline. If you're going up a curve, it's typically easiest to go forward up the curve. You tilt the wheelchair back and put the casters on the curb, push the wheelchair up to where it's directly in front of the curb, and then put your body sideways against the chair and bump them up, pushing the back of the chair up um, until they're fully on the sidewalk. And the drive wheel should stay in constant contact with the curb while you're doing that. If you are going up a curb backwards, it's a little more difficult, but you can do it. You will tilt the patient backwards into a wheelie. You get them close to the curb and then you use your body. We typically start out in a lunge and use our legs to pull them up the curb. Um, once they're all the way up on the surface, you slowly lower their casters down to the ground before you start to move them. This can be a little bit scary for a patient, so be careful if you are trying this technique and make sure you're explaining what you're doing. Going down a curb, um, it's typically easiest to go down a curb backwards. So you back the patient up to the edge of the curb. You put your body up against the back of the chair with your legs um, spread like in a lunge. <laughs> um, and then you shift your weight down and slowly use your body to slowly lower their weight down to the ground. Then you pull backwards until the casters are all the way off of the curb as well. Um, they should be in the air until they're all the way onto the ground. So what I mean is you keep them in a wheelie pull them backwards until they've cleared the area of the curb and then lower the casters down to the ground. You don't put the casters on and bump it down because it can get bumpy, but also their, their feet could drag. If you're going forward, you put them in a wheelie position. You use your body mechanics to slowly lower them down, and then you control the descent of the casters down to the ground. This one can also be scary, so just be careful. For someone that needs to go up and down the stairs, um, if they are dependent, you will need three people to safely do this transfer. And um, the largest or strongest, tallest person will be in the back holding on to the um, hand grips. The others need to hold on to non-removable parts of the wheelchair. So the base of the wheelchair, if the, if the um, arms are removable, I wouldn't hold there. Um, you could even hold um, the underneath surface where the um, seat is as long as your hand is not kind of so close to the wheel that it might get trapped. But two places to hold on and have good body mechanics, um, bending at the legs and um, using your legs to power up. 
you will back up to the first step. You will tip the wheelchair back into that wheelie position. You'll count to three and bump them up one stair at a time. And you'll do it every time you'll count again. Um, pause on every step. It's very similar to going up and down a curve backwards. Going down the steps, uh, roll the wheelchair close to the top of the stairs, tip it backwards, and slowly lower it down each step one at a time. Um, you're typically able to do this with less people, maybe even just one person. It's just like the process of going down a curb. It would just be like going down multiple consecutive curbs. For maintenance, you want to make sure that you um, routinely check the tires, the spokes, the locks, make sure everything's in a good position, um, condition, and that you store it in a safe, dry place so it doesn't start to rust or to dry rot, um, that you use the wheelchair only for the purposes that it was designed for, you don't want your kids out in the yard racing in the wheelchair, and that you uh, use the owner's manual for maintenance. So what we've covered uh, for this lecture, wheelchairs um, are a, consist of postural support on a mobile base. There's a lot of options for different wheelchairs. The trade-offs, um, as we saw earlier, are vast. If you're getting a more stable surface, you're probably not as mobile. So you've got to figure out what is functional for the patient and provides the most independence. If it fits poorly, it may cause injury or decrease their function. And um, whenever you are assisting somebody by pushing them in the wheelchair, you certainly need good body mechanics. We're now going on to chapter 15, where we will talk about um, assistive devices. Oh, let me do the overview. We are going to talk about parallel bars, walkers, crutches, and canes. The parallel bars are very stable. They're the most stable, but they are not mobile. They do not move. They stay right there where they're at. Um, this is typically kind of your first step progression um, for mobility. It's the first place you want to have a patient standing up and taking their first steps. Um, the therapist needs to stand inside of the bars with the patient in order to guard. If you're on the other side of the bars and have to reach over, it's a really dangerous position, you wouldn't be able to help the patient very much if they started to fall. Um, so we typically use the bars to build their gait skills before we progress to a less restrictive device like a walker or a cane or something. Um, while they are in the bars, it's pretty difficult to turn right here. The person outside is guarding while the person inside is positioning their leg. I'll show you kind of a different way in class that you can do that more easily and protect your back. Um, but let me show you how to turn in the bars. Uh, you stay on one side of the patient. The patient starts to move their legs. Then they grab, they move one arm at a time um, as they turn. So both arms grab in the bar, then switch for the uh, final portion of the turn and now you're in front of them. You started out behind them, now you're in front of them because your position doesn't change. You just kind of move your hands along their gait belt so you're still adding um, support the whole time and able to guard them. Um, once the patient is able to walk the entire length of the parallel bars with good form, that's when you start thinking they can use an assistive device and walk outside of the parallel bars. So the next assistive device we typically progress them to is a walker. This is a standard walker. It doesn't have any wheels. It provides a lot of stability. It allows you to unload a leg if you need to. Um, this one is called a pickup walker because you have to pick it up every time after every step in order to move it. It does not have wheels. It requires a little more energy from the patient, but it's also more stable. So depending on what you need, it may be a better choice for some patients. Rolling walkers are less stable, but they allow faster and more continuous gait. So again, if the patient has a little bit of stability there, that might be a better option. The typical uh, walkers are, if it's a standard walker with wheels, it typically has wheels in the front and then the um, single point in the back. So if it's not 
gliding or sliding very well. You could put tennis balls or glides on the back so that it sort of does move in a continuous um, pattern and you don't have to stop and move the uh, walker as you go. Um, you can also attach uh, arm platforms for somebody who has significant weakness and they're not able to grip the walker, then they can still have their arm on a platform and still allow some support there. When you're teaching someone to stand from a wheelchair or a seat um, using the walker, you make sure that their arms, both arms, um, at least one arm is on the chair um, on the armrest pushing up. If they grab with both arms the walker, it's just going to pull back on them. So they don't need to grab the walker until they're fully in standing. Some people really prefer to have one arm on the chair and one arm on the walker because they just don't feel secure. Um, you could do that, but ideally both arms would be on the armrest and they are in like an arrow formation where they're able to push straight down so that they can stand straight up. Um, we always tell the patient to scoot forward and to lean forward before attempting to stand. Um, I typically say nose over toes, so lean forward so that your nose is over your toes before you stand up. Otherwise, you'll have a lot of weight on your hips and you're not going to be able to stand that way. Uh, when you walk with the walker, you would progress one leg and then the other and then the walker. Uh, it moves when your legs are not moving. This is with a standard um, pickup walker. If you have wheels, then you can just push it forward as you're walking. You do not want to get too far forward because then your center of mass will be anterior to your support, so you could fall forward. But you also don't want to be too far backwards, which is what I see more often, especially with rollators and four-wheel walkers. Um, is that they're too far backwards and then they're leaning forward and it also puts you at a ri higher risk of falling. When you are using a walker to go up and down a curb, you place the walker up the curb, you place your good leg or your stronger leg up on the curb and then use it to pull the other leg up. You also need to lean forward so that you have a little bit of um, so that you're able to use your arms to push up um, support there. And so uh, remember the saying, up with the good, down with the bad. So we go up the curb using the good leg. And then we come down the curb using the bad. So first you move your walker down on the bottom surface. Then you move the weaker leg down. And then you follow it by the stronger leg because the stronger leg it's controlling the descent, how fast you uh, lower down to the other leg. If you are going up and down stairs with a walker, it really is challenging. There's a lot of different ways you can turn the walker, but all of them are not ideal. Um, so if there's a handrail, I highly suggest using the handrail, and then you could turn the walker sideways you could fold it and put it sideways. You could try to put it on one step, part, the back part on one step and the front part on another. All of them are not that safe and not that secure. So I would highly recommend using the armrest when, or the arm rail whenever available and just be really cautious with that. All right, so once the patient starts to rock their walker where they um, put the back portion down and then don't put the front portion down until they step. They probably don't need the walker anymore. They may still need an assistive device, but they're ready to progress to something less restrictive. So maybe a hemi walker or a single point or any type of cane, um, something like that. If they're able to pretty much walk without the support of their walker, they're not placing a lot of pressure down on their hands or they're rocking it, then it's time to progress. Um, here are a few types of auxiliary crutches. Auxiliary meaning they go up to your armpit. The crutches allow for greater mobility than a walker, but give you less stability. So this is why we typically see younger people with good um, strength using crutches. Um, 
they also allow unloading of one leg. So if you're not able to place weight on one leg or have weight bearing restrictions, then crutches are a good option. In order to estimate the fit of the walker, you could measure the patient's height and subtract 16 inches, or you could do a, an equation to, where you uh, determine 77% of the patient's height. You could also use the markings on the crutches. Typically on the side, the newer crutches have heights on them and you make sure that the um, little push-in thing moves to the proper height. But another way is the ATNR position. ATNR is a reflex that infants have when they turn their head one way, they bring their arms up into a fencing pose. So if they straighten one arm and bend the other, then that is typically the correct length for the um, crutch height. Um, but once you determine how tall it needs to be, so first you try and get it to the right height, then you stand them up and check fit. So how to confirm the fit, they need to place the crutches slightly forward and out to the side, and you um, should be able to put two fingers between the crutch and the person's armpits. If not, then it could pr press up into the armpits, put too much pressure, and it could cause a nerve injury, like a brachial plexus injury. Um, typically, I find a lot of people putting too much pressure through their armpits. A lot of people think that you're supposed to rest on the armpits there, and you're not. The pressure should be going through the hand on the hand grips. Um, one of the biggest issues is almost every time I've ever adjusted somebody's crutches, I've had to move the hand grips up. They actually had the crutches either too high or even at the right height, but couldn't reach the hand grips at the right height. So they would either raise the crutch up so they could reach the hand grips or they would have to lean in a weird position or they would just have to support themselves through their armpits. So I have always, um, every patient that I've had, I had to move the hand grips up higher so that they could weight bear through the hands. So I would definitely check that when adjusting somebody's walk, uh, crutches. In order to do a sit to stand transfer with crutches, you move both cr crutches on one side and use the armrest on one side of the chair and the hand grips on the crutches to push yourself up. Then once you are up and stable, you put one crutch under each arm. Um, with crutches, we typically do the crutches first, then the involved leg, then the uninvolved leg. Now, especially if they're weight bearing, sometimes we will do the crutches and the involved leg at the same time because it just basically swings through. Um, but there are various gait patterns that you can do with crutches and we'll go over those gait patterns in a second and a few slides down. Um, another thing to keep in mind is when they're turning to make sure they do small steps, incremental steps, rather than just trying to do one big turn. When you are assisting a patient with going up and down the stairs, of course, you're going to instruct them to go up with the good and down with the bad, but they can also move the crutches. Um, so they will keep it on the lower step. So whether if they're going up, it will be on the bottom step. If they're going down, it will be on the step below them. They'll keep it on the bottom step. They could either use both crutches or they could use a handrail on one side and put both crutches on the other side. If you do that, I recommend putting your hand on the inside rather than over the top of the crutches. Um, but the therapist needs to stand below the patient, on the stair below the patient. So if they're going up, the therapist will stand behind them below the patient. And if they're going down, the ther therapist will stand in front of them below the patient. But either way, the therapist always stands below the patient. And the crutches also always go on the lower stair. So you saw before, it was on the lower stair right here as he's going up. Now it's on the lower stair here as he's coming down. Um, I would recommend if you have both crutches on one side to bring your arm on the inside of the hand rail and hold it more like how she's holding on the inside of the grips rather than over the auxiliary pads because that way it won't jam into your arm. Um, there's other ways you could hold. If you're holding two, you could hold it in a T formation there or you could hold one in the 
same hand that you're holding the handrail, however it's comfortable for the patient. When you're using patient, uh, a walker, you want to make sure they're standing erect the whole time, that they're not placing any pressure through the armpits, um, and then just understand that they can use various gait patterns with crutches and that they may start with one gait pattern and eventually progress to the other. We'll go through those gait patterns after we talk about forearm crutches. Forearm crutches provide less stability, but they are more mobile than the auxiliary crutches. They also provide the various gait patterns, two, three, and four point, but they're typically used or often used with someone who has KAFOs, which are knee, ankle, foot orthoses. They keep the knee kind of locked into an extended position, and you can do like a swing through gait pattern um, with that. Um, or even a swing too, both, both are um, possible. So with the forearm crutches, they're also called loft strand or Canadian crutches. You'll hear them referred to by each of those. The, um, okay, we talked about all this stuff. Here is a picture though of how you kind of do the swing to or swing through. And so the, the you set the crutches on the ground ahead of you, you kind of jump through and then you kind of lean back to stabilize yourself while you're moving the crutches forward. It is an advanced mobility move and um, might take a lot of practice for somebody new at it. How to stand with forearm crutches, you can place them both on one side, use one armrest and then the crutches to push up. Um, some patients will have one on each side and just use them as a force to pull themselves to standing, put to push up with. Um, if they've been doing that for years, I wouldn't teach them any different, but if they're brand new at it, I would teach it this way with both of them on one side. They want to have an erect posture and there's various gates that they can use and they can progress from one to another. These are the types of gates. So a two point gate, um, you, so right now they're just standing still all on the ground. Okay, they will move the right um, crutch at the same time as the left foot, and then they'll move the left crutch at the same time as the right foot. So they're doing an alternating gait pattern where they're moving one foot with the opposite crutch at the same time. That's a two-point gait. For a three-point gait, they move, um, the crutches, so typically ask, that's a swing through, that's a crutches, but both feet. It's confusing the way they have it. Yes, so um, the crutches and the involved foot are moving at the same time, and then the uninvolved. Here's why, here's why the um, left foot is white the whole time because it's hanging off the ground. It's not being placed on the ground at all. Sorry, it confused me for a second when I was looking at it. Um, so this would be with a non-weight bearing foot. If they have are not able to weight, bear weight on their left foot, the left foot is just hanging. It's never being placed on the ground. And so they put the crutches down and the foot, the leg kind of swings forward with it. And then they kind of hop the other foot forward while the crutches are stable then they move the crutches again and hop forward. That is a three-point gait, somebody with a knee surgery or ankle injury and they can't put weight on it. You've seen a lot of people probably in high school or athletes that have are doing that gait. The swing through is what I showed you with the loft strand crutch um, where they move both crutches and then they jump both feet through. Then they move both crutches and then they jump both feet through. That's a swing through. Four-point gait. You're moving everything at its own time. You move a crutch, you move a foot. You move a crutch, you move a foot. You move a crutch, you move a foot. Crutch, foot. So four things are moving separately. Okay, whenever you're using forearm crutches to do the stairs, there's various ways you can do it. You can kind of perform it like um, you would do auxiliary crutches by putting them both on one side, using a handrail on the other and keeping them on the stair below you, on the stair below you. So here she's going down those stairs. She should have already moved her crutches down to it. Um, and this is a possibility if 
you have are able to bear weight on both legs and able to bend both knees. If not, you may have to go up a different way. These are very advanced moves, and so if it's somebody that's new, they need to really practice this before doing it without you standing there and guarding them. So the first one, both of these are going up a stair. The first one, she's turned around backwards, and she has the crutches on one side, the handrail on the other, and she is leaning forward and hopping her hips backwards up the stairs. The second one, hit, and with that one, it's on the stair above. Notice that. It's on the stair above that she's going to. With the second one, he has it on the stair below. He completely places his weight on his arms and pulls his legs up to the next stair. And then quickly, while he's kind of in an extended position, moves the crutches up to the stair. That is um, an advanced move. <laughs> Hard to do. To go down the stairs, we are typically going to um, lean forward, pull both legs down at the same time. Once you're stable in a standing position on the bottom, then you move the crutch down or your hand down the rail. There is a way to teach someone to fall with a crutch, but to avoid falling with crutches, we want to make sure that we're working on balance with that patient, that we're working on leg strength, that they have the appropriate device and it fits them appropriate, that they are uh, working effectively on gait training, teaching them how to avoid dragging their feet or doing things that would cause them to fall, and then remind them of uh, the importance of having good lighting, night lights, and um, things like that in their house so they can always see where they're going and removing obstacles in their pathway so they don't trip over a rug or a toy or something in their pathway. But if they were to fall, the way that we teach them to do it is to drop their crutches and to bring their arms out um, to the side with their elbows slightly flexed and turn their head to the side so that they protect their head while they're falling. To get back up after a fall, is hard. If they don't have KAFO, so they're able to bend their knees, then and the, uh, first off, if they're able to crawl to a nearby chair and then bump themselves up to the chair and stand from there, that would be best. But if they're not, they can gather their um, assistive device, put them both on one side, get up into a kneeling position, and then into half kneeling, so one leg in front, and then push themselves up into standing. Takes a lot of strength, a lot of coordination and motor control, hard movement to do. If they're with, if they have KAFOs on, so that keeps their knees in extension, it's even harder to do. They grab both of their um, assistive devices, straighten the legs, go into kind of a downward dog position and push their butt up. And then once they get high enough that the weight is on their legs, they quickly remove the, quickly move the crutches backwards to go to a standing position. I've seen people do this. It's impressive. Um, it takes a lot of strength and a lot of practice. Progressing from crutches, so if their weight bearing restrictions have changed and now they're able to wear, bear more weight, you may want to progress. If their functional balance has improved, you may progress. Um, and typically we'll progress to a cane from the crutches or to nothing at all, just depending. Um, knee walker, you may have seen, they're, they've been more and more common lately. Um, they allow you to weight bear through the knee and above um, and require less arm strength, but they still keep all the weight off of your ankle and below. So if the patient had an ankle or a foot surgery, then this would might be a good option. You cannot do stairs with this, but you can glide around the house with it as long as you can bear weight through your knee and above. So if you have weight bearing restrictions on the knee or hip, you cannot use the knee walker. Hemi walker is similar to a regular walker. It's just half. It is on one side. Um, it's good for somebody who has weakness on one side and able to use the other. It has a nice stable wide base um, and can allow you to do um, partial weight bearing or full or weight bearing is tolerated, but cannot fully de-weight the leg. So you cannot use it with somebody who's non-weight bearing. Um, 
if they start to rock this walker as well, then it's time to move on, maybe a cane or something. So if they start to put the back wheel, back legs and then the front, um, they're probably not using it appropriately and don't really need it like they used to. To stand up with the Hemi Walker, it's convenient. They had added a short little uh, hand rest in order to help you with standing up. So you can put one one arm on the hand rest on the or the bottom handle of the Hemi Walker, one arm on the armrest of the chair, and then push up and then move your arm up to the top portion of the Hemi Walker. With canes, um, there's a huge variety of canes from all the all kinds. Um, I found a lot of the older men that I saw in the um, clinics might come in with a walking stick, and it was just kind of a straight stick. It may not be the right height or provide very good stability, but they refused to use anything but a walking stick. So I came across that a lot in the clinic. And if that's the case, try and work with what they have. But ideally, you give them something more suitable. Okay, so they can um, be used singly just on one side, which you would then put it on the opposite side of the injury. So if the left leg is weak or injured, you would put it in the right hand. There's a lot of people that do it the opposite way. They put it on the same side as the injury and they refuse to switch it. Uh, if that's the case, you just tell them right and let them do what they do, but you tell them the right way. Um, you typically will progress from a cane with a wider base of t support to a smaller and the single point cane, of course, gives you the least stability and so it would be kind of the last thing you would progress to unless the patient just refused to use the other devices. Um, in order to stand, you put the cane um, you put the cane in one hand and if, there, if possible, use the armrest to push up. Um, if it is a cane that stands on its own, like a quad cane, then you don't even have to use the cane at all. You can just have it sitting in front of you and push up on the armrest. Um, but with a single point cane, you'll have to be holding it in some way or it will fall while you're standing up. I didn't have a picture of somebody using the armrest, so I'm sorry, I just couldn't find one. All right, again, up with the good, down with the bad. Don't matter what you're using, it's always that. Um, with a big wide base cane, quad cane, you may have to turn it sideways to go up the stairs. Um, often you're gonna use the handrail on one side and the cane on the other, um, but you may have to switch which side you're holding the cane on if the handrail is only on one side. Uh, you, I like to do, you could do it Either way, we'll have to try it in the clinic, which one we're more comfortable with, moving the cane first or keeping the cane on the lower step. Um, in here, it looks in this picture, it looks like he has it on the lower step and he's stepping above the cane. All right, so moving through doorway with an assistive device. If the doorway opens towards you, I have a hair, it's killing me. I've got it. Um, if it moves towards you, then you pull the door open as wide as you can, block the door with the crutch, and then go through. If it opens away from you, you can pull the door open, block the crutch, and walk through, facing forward, or you could turn around backwards and kind of use your backside to push the door open and go through that way. It may take a few more steps to get through, though. Some special conditions, of course, with someone who has Alzheimer's, um, you need to be careful because they may forget to use their assistive device, they may forget how to use it, um, or forget that they're even injured, so you have to be careful and um, you want them to be able to make eye contact and look at you and see what you're doing, so giving them visual cues or tactile cues, but verbal cues typically don't last as long. Um, sometimes they aren't as um, able to learn the assistive device, so they may be more comfortable doing hand in hand or holding your arm. Um, if they've been doing that for a while, that might just come naturally to them. There's some um, research and stuff below about um, mobility devices and Alzheimer's. If you want to read that, um, that'd be fun. 
Okay, and then with muscular dystrophy, this is a neurological disorder. It can affect the arms and legs. It's progressive, so they're going to get weaker over time. The assistive device they use may change and get more and more restrictive versus most other people were trying to get less and less restrictive. But this one, they may need more stability as it progresses. You need to make sure you lock the knee braces um, to allow for secure weight bearing if their legs are significantly weak. Um, with this case, they would probably use a swing to or swing through pattern, but the disease varies greatly, and so every patient you see, it might be a different consideration for this condition on what it would help them the most and restrict them the least. On that statement, we always want to use the least restrictive device that gives them the most function. So you want the most function, the least restriction, but you have to consider stability. You don't want them to have a risk of falling. You want to confirm that it fits properly and check the safety, um, such as the cane tips, making sure they're still in good um, shape every time that you see the patient before you start walking them. Uh, that's it for our play posit for today. I hope you guys enjoyed and let me know if you have any questions.